herpetological community for that work. So his talk this morning is about probing the Umwelt of reptiles, and I will let him translate for you. Gordon. Okay, well, I'm very happy uh, to, to, to be here. This is the first time I've been in Montreal, I think, since I left for my honeymoon from here in 1966. So that's a, that's a long time, right? Uh, and this is also the first time I got to meet uh, Stephen Harnad. Um, I guess I was one of your early contributors to when he uh, founded the Behavioral and Brain Sciences Journal, and I made commentaries back in the 70s. Right, but we've never met, so this is actually a very fine opportunity. And uh, what I plan to do today uh, is uh, give you sort of a sort of a whirlwind tour of the reptile world as I've sort of experienced it over the over the years. And I, I have both a scientific and, in a sense, a political agenda here. And uh, I hope to convince you of some things. I hope to make you a little bit of a revolutionary. Now, I've been working for over 50 years on, the, on these areas and with lots of different people. Uh, Stan Rand and Chuck Carpenter uh, were two of the early pioneers in studying reptile behavior and were mentors and good friends, and uh, both unfortunately are not now deceased. I've also worked with many students and colleagues, and uh, I'm going to be using lots of their contributions as I talk, and uh, I hope to sort of acknowledge those as I go along but uh, I may forget. But <laughs> I really owe a lot to many different, uh, di different people. Now, reptiles have a bad rap in ethology and compared to psychology. Here are some quotations. Uh, the vision of reptiles is unimportant, simplistic, peripheral, expendable proto-animals remains strongly rooted in society. Now, these are all scientific papers. This is in tree, our trends uh, paper on ecology and reptiles in tropics. Miranda. Uh, uh, this is from Kalman. Uh, numerous behavioral phenomena indicate a high evolutionary level of the avian brain. Remember, they've got this contrast, birds and those reptiles, right? Comparable or even superior to that of most mammals. Birds now have, no longer we talk about bird brains. That's actually not a, uh, a put down anymore. Uh, Key elements, visual acuity, color, stereoscopic vision, cognitive learning abilities, elaborate vocalization, communication, imitation, advanced social behavior, nesting, nursing, prolonged family partnership, migration, homing, colony formation, food storing. In reptiles, similar phenomena are absent, or rather infrequent and less elaborate. A recent paper by Bugna, the Austrian people who, Tom's a good friend. He's got wrong here, I think. Reptile cognition should not be underestimated, but nothing at the level and scope of bird cognition has been reported for this animal group so far. On the other hand, this is uh, Charas, a French biologist who wrote one of the first books on snakes called The Viper on the Viper, and uh, he had a little different take. The Viper is taken as the image of malice and cruelty. Again, that's the common view. Not really, okay. He was more a pioneer. Reptiles, including dangerous snakes and crocodiles, have been actually been and still are in places revered and protected, and not for ecological or conservation reasons. So ambivalence towards these animals is also involved. And I would argue our anthropocentric biases, their threat to mammalian and thus human superiority and a lingering attachment to an archaic view of the great chain of being exists today even among scientists who formerly would eschew such things. I hope to provide an alternative view and give you a historical perspective. So let's go back to some of the founders of ethology. Von Frisch, along with Lorenz and Tim Bergen, received the Nobel Prize in Physiology in 1973. I still remember the day when that announcement came out. I was at a meeting in Texas. 
Carvon fish, uh, as many know, after showing that fish can hear using conditioning methods and honeybees can see colors, uh, then discovered the complex bee uh, communication dancing uh, language, which uh, got Don Griffin and others really excited that, hey, other species have abilities that we have not yet appreciated. Uh, his work was not readily accepted at, uh, at first, now it is widely so, and there are loads of studies coming out showing that bees with such minuscule brains can do cognitive feats beyond most mammals and birds in certain areas. I mentioned the minuscule brains because one of the put downs of reptiles is that they only have, for their body size, a tenth of the brain of a mammal or a bird. I'm gonna come back to that near the end. Now, Lorenz, uh, many of you know about his uh, work on imprinting. Um, he built on observations of others before him, like Heinroth. Uh, led to much research. And he was the, uh, founded his work on the f idea of the releaser, the concept that there are animals, stimuli, animals uh, have that other animals respond to and form their companionships and lead to imprinting phenomenon and other attachments, social releasers, he, he called them. He started off early on with an interest in salamanders. Nico Tinbergen uh, brought to you some models to study sign or key stimuli to the high level, often in field settings. And he had many influential students and pioneered the modern focus on adaptation-oriented behavioral ecology. Uh, everybody must be familiar with the, his use of stimuli that just restricted the number of cues and the animals were responding to those cues, even though they were very artificial, as if they were responding to the whole animal. Where do these ideas come from? Who influenced them all? If you look on the left, Evolution psychology, the philosophical roots of psychology, and, and neural uh, science were sort of the three areas in the 1900s that blended into uh, the fields of ethology, comparative psychology, and neurobiology, which are now blending together again. But this is just a, uh, a graph from uh, Greer and Burke's book. But if you see before Heinroth and Whitman and Craig, von Frisch and Lorenz, you see von Euskel. Jakob von Juskel. He was key to what I'm talking about, and he formulated the idea that we need to look at the umwelt of animals. And this is Jakob von Juskel, uh, who studied behavior and physiology of invertebrates primarily. And he developed the theory of the umwelt, sign stimuli. He was a founder of the field of semiotics. Uh, search image idea came from him. This is from one of his books. Uh, a toad uh, will respond to a moving match as if it was a real worm and attempt to, to eat it. I've replicated those kinds of experiments. The idea being that there were very simple aspects of a normal stimulus that could trigger a rather complex response. He had a critical orientation that I want to emphasize here. Our anthropocentric way of looking at things must retreat further and further, and the standpoint of the animal must be the only decisive one. We translated some of his early, uh, his early book from 1909, and that was one of the key phrases that struck out to me. Now that's anthropomorphism was the sin, major sin when I grew up in animal behavior, attributing human characteristics to non-human entities. Can't do that. But I also noticed that uh, you could go the reverse route, anthropomorphism by omission, by unwitting neglecting the animal perspective and its umwelt. And so I proposed critical anthropomorphism, using our stance as human beings to propose the presence of testable cognitive, emotional, and behavioral processes in other species, informed by rigorous incorporation of what we develop scientifically in terms of our understanding of those animals. And we need to know, 
aspects of their ecology, their physiology, their sensory abilities, their social organization, and so on. And that's an essential virtue. So judging other species by markers such as screams, facial expressions, or speed of responding can be uncritically anthropomorphic and a hallmark of anthropocentrism. And this is particularly true with reptiles because they don't wag their tails like those dogs that we saw. They don't have those facial expressions. They don't have ear positions that move, that we can relate to, that somehow reflect some of our mammalian psychology. So Van Uyckhoff's major contribution, in a sense, is this figure, very influential figure, this functional circle. If you notice, they have the perceptual field with the receptors. The receptor it could be your eye, your nose, ear, and a normal object, uh, such as a food object, uh, has cues that the animal responds to through the central receptor, central effector, through the motor field. And so say it is a prey object. The animal sees it, approaches it, then the visual field of that object has changed, so the behavior changes, it attacks the prey, now it's in a different mode, and you get the sequential organization of behavior as the effectors, receptors, stimuli change. But notice his inner world of the subject. To me, that was a really important insight that he had, and it was basically ignored by those classical ethologists, including Tinberg, who was adamantly against studying anything to deal with the subjective world of animals. I got started years ago studying garter snakes, umwelt. I would love snakes all the time, since I was a young kid, and I realized that they have a chemical orientation. And we just saw a study with using cotton swabs with the dogs. Well, I developed this, uh, using this over 50 years ago with our garter snakes, and what we found is the baby garter snake has never eaten anything in its life. If you present a chemical cue from a worm or a fish or an insect or a mouse or a crayfish, depending on the species, it will respond to that as if it was the real prey item. It will approach it, tongue flicking, and then actually open mouth and attack the swamp. We've done loads of studies on this. I've probably published more on this. Yes? Sure, yes, yeah, please do that. mentioned uh, Conrad Lawrence and imprinting. I'm just wondering, so you, uh, you, you, you swab a, a crayfish and you present it to uh, a naive uh, snake that has not eaten anything, yes? yes. So you're saying, but he, he, this, this snake will, will react uh, because of, of, of uh, its genetic makeup to this. It's not learned. No. Okay. Uh, st there were studies uh, before I got into this uh, business where people had shown that snakes were very, uh, res would respond to chemical cues, adult snakes, you know, of an earthworm, for instance. Uh, but no one had, as far as I know, gone back and looked at a baby snake that had never eaten anything. And one of my first papers that got me all excited and led to my dissertation topic was the fact that the baby snake seemed to respond to an earthworm or a fish odor, but not to an insect odor. But these snakes never eat insects in the wild, only uh, fish and uh, worms and, and leeches. And so we started a whole series of experiments looking at different species of snakes, showing that there was a very close match between what they would eat in the wild, what their normal diets were, and how the animals were programmed, you might say, to respond innately at birth. But the key here was, just because it has this innate, rather precise uh, nature, didn't mean that it was immune to experience. And so we could show that with feeding experience or getting sick, illness induced aversions, one trial learning, these snakes would change their behavior. We also found that there were developmental changes, that uh, as snakes grew older, their preferences for different prey would, would change that were available in, in the wild. And these 
were somehow triggered sometimes by genetic maturation changes, or it could be just through experience that they were now finding different prey and they were able to uh, uh, switch to them. Uh, the same species from different parts, Michigan and Wisconsin snakes, uh, garter snakes, both will eat worms and fish, but the uh, snakes in Wisconsin are more fish prefers uh, than the ones in uh, the Michigan. So we could show that there were geographic variations in their uh, genetic propensities to respond to these different prey. But experience could affect these very readily. One of the, talked about crayfish, there are crayfish snakes, and uh, uh, we showed that uh, baby snakes would respond to, they eat crayfish, but some species only eat soft shells crayfish, intermolts. They prefer those stimuli from the soft shell rather than the hard shell phase. There are other gar uh, snakes that prefer the hard shell, only eat the hard shell uh, crayfish, and they responded more to the hard shell uh, stimuli. So these are very, can be a very precise genetic match in a way, or innate match between the animal's uh, or, uh, diet and its behavior, but it can also be overridden rather easily in some cases. But I'm not going to talk too much about the chemical stimuli, even though I published more on that than any others. Now remember that for von Euskel, the Umwelt is virtually the German word for environment. And he was focused on the environment from the animal's perspective, not the surroundings, which are, so you might say, uh, what's out there. And so an animal's surroundings are the environment of the observer, maybe us, the scientist, not the animal being studied. And of course, ours, what we see around us, is not true reality either, right? So the comparison of inner worlds is just as instructive as the comparison of environments. And too much as scientists, we focus on the environment as we see it, the uh, surroundings. But notice that his, his approach to science, he was a most thoughtful man. I, th I love this quote. The truth lies directly before us in the reality surrounding us. However, we cannot use it as it is. An unbroken description of reality would be simultaneously the truest and most useless thing in the world, and it would certainly not be science. If you want to make reality and therefore truth useful to science, we must do violence to reality. We must introduce a distinction which does not exist in nature between essential and inessential. In nature, everything is equally essential. By seeking out the relationships that seem essential to us, we order the material in a surveyable way at the same time. Then we are doing science. So he really emphasized the provisional nature of our knowledge. A few years ago, I tried to combine two of the von Euskel's uh, uh, functional circles to deal with social relationships, okay? The communicative aspect of so might one mind interacting with another, which is in a way the focus of this, of, of this meeting. And so how do we do this? This modification of the uh, functional circle is actually, I think, is, is characterizes a good deal of the field of animal communication. Brain imaging, things that we've talked about, uh, and complex experimental designs are attempts to get at the interview, inner world through objective, reliable data. Gordon? Yes? You said one mind interacting with another mind. Uh, that's controversial. Of course. A lot of what I'm saying is probably controversial. So another thing I did was, remember Tim Bergen didn't want to deal with these topics. Uh, but he did write a classic paper that's highly cited, probably his most cited publication, 1963, on aims and methods of ethology, in which he said there were four essential aims, four essential types of questions you asked about behavior. We needed to know all these answers, even though as scientists we might not address them all in our own work, but we need to consider them. One is the issue of control, causation, physiology, sensory processes, mechanisms, the issue of development, 
ontogeny and plasticity of behavior. This is what sort of psychologists sort of have typically have focused on. Then there's the question of adaptive uh, function or survival value and the questions of evolution and phylogeny. Genetic and cultural change, I include cultural evolution along with genetic evolution as important processes, and we now know that they are intertwined in, in many respects. But I added this, the private experience aim, the personal or phenomenal world, study of emotions, patterns and processes in life as experienced. So number five then encompasses what Skinner calls private events, von Eusel's inner world, Dennett's heterophenomenology, Griffin's awareness, and issues of consciousness, mind, attentions, thoughts, feelings, subjective states in general. But it's not equivalent to any of those nor captive to any single definition. I've also argued in the same paper coming up with the idea of critical anthropomorphism that beyond behavioral observation, there are two and only two methods to ascertain consciousness or emotional feelings in other animals. One is what I call subjective analogical inference, I'm not going to go into any detail here, and neural analogical inference. And this holds for other humans as well. How do we know what you're thinking about? How do we know what your inner world is like? We do it in these different ways. Uh, and of course, we get conned all the time by actors, con men, politicians, some of whom are the same. Key in uh, animal sentience, uh, the kickoff uh, issue on fish sentience, or fish feel pain, uh, was a debate that uh, 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 Stephen hosted. Uh, he only would accept the latter, neurological focus, not behavioral. And some of the debates in that were actually conflicts between the people approaching this from the, either number one or number two. Now, on to reptiles. And why I consider myself a failed scientist. Along with many others, empirically challenging our view of reptile uh, behavior. And I could cite many studies. The last uh, decade has seen a, uh, a wide range of studies on all different topics. And certain reptiles, certain groups of lizards and so on, are getting to be sort of, even though I don't like the word model, uh, just like a first speaker, uh, they become sort of a model system for studying certain things. Now, what about reptiles here? Just to uh, remind you of the relationships here, uh, the amniote ancestors uh, led to uh, what they call mammal-like ma mammals or synapsids, and then the, the mammals that, we, uh, that we're part of. And then reptiles are actually uh, involved, the tuatara, a lone species, which is very interesting, but I'm not going to talk about. But I'm going to talk about the others, the squamates, which are the lizards and snakes, the turtles, and the crocodilians. And then dinosaurs uh, uh, are related, and birds are, uh, so birds in a way, are, birds are reptiles. And so when I talk about reptiles, I'm talking about non-avian reptiles. I don't want to say avian or non-avian reptiles all the time. So we'll use birds and reptiles, even though birds are reptiles. Feathered reptiles. Now, herpetologists who you would think would be the ones who would think that their animals were actually pretty good. You know, I mean, studying animals, you have a tendency to want to sort of praise your own species. People study primates or uh, birds. Hey, they're the genius. They're the really important animals. Uh, that's not true with reptiles. So Wilfred Neal was a leading herpetologist. He wrote an important book, Last of the Ruling Reptiles, All in Crocodilians, Bringing Everything Together. Uh, and he addressed these things. Like there were fables, he said, going back uh, to Bartram's first expeditions in the uh, United States, and then McElhenney, part of the uh, Tabasco pepper sauce uh, family in New Orleans, who spent years watching alligators and wrote a book back in the 1930s. And he said th things such as that uh, he's seen mother uh, alligators uh, catching large fish, and they're holding their jaws and feeding uh, their, their babies and staying with the mothers for, uh, uh, the baby staying with the mothers for a long time. Uh, showing parental care. To Neil, this was hogwash. 
In reality, an alligator inherits its patterns of action just as it inherits its anatomical structure. A given action, like an anatomical organ, has evolved because it is favorable to the success and survival of the species. It is absurd to think that an alligator, on the one hand, has evolved a pattern of action involving intensive care of the young, and on the other hand, a pattern involving predation upon these same young. That's 1971. Then we had the whole phase about elevating dinosaurs to close to birds, and now we know that uh, birds are uh, feathered dinosaurs as well as feathered reptiles. And uh, Desmond's popular book, um, and uh, he argued that the dinosaurs were actually not really reptilian, as he says here. Uh, there's unreptilian aspect of sauropods. Um, the dinosaur's life was probably far more highly organized than is commonly supposed. Unlike solitary lizards, many dinosaurs were gregarious, traveling in herds like elephants and antelope. Uh, he didn't have much appreciation for this is along with other comments in this book about slow, dim, sprawling reptiles and trying to see dinosaurs as more bird-like, even mammal-like than reptiles. They had to confront, unsuccessfully in my view, the fact that actually dinosaurs had very small brains also. And that uh, the idea that they were endothermic, and now we're getting to realize that many of them probably were, is nonetheless, it was controversial, and it's not true that they all were. Then we had another thing, a leading, Neuro, uh, neuropsychologist, Paul McLean, and his idea that triune brain. We had the neocortex, which makes us really smart. Uh, then we had the limbic system, which gives us our emotions. Then we had the reptilian brain, right? Which is where instinct is. Three brains in one. Reptiles he allowed could have complex instincts of sex and aggression, and the emotions of rage and fear, but no positive emotions such as care, affection, joy, or play. So they could only arise through parental care, and of course reptiles didn't have any. He was ignorant, of course, of the fact that there was this work showing that crocodiles and alligators do have parental care. But then this got even worse with people like Carl Sagan of the original Cosmos series, and a very uh, an important popular writer in, in science. He wrote this book, The Dragons of Eden, and he reproduced, he used McLean as the key source of uh, the ideas in that book. And again, you see the reptilian complex. And he had things such as, uh, the reason to think that the beginning of altruistic behavior in the Olympic system. Uh, Indeed, with rare exceptions in social insects, mammals and birds are the only organs to devote substantial attention to the care of their young, and evolution development that through the long period of plasticity permits take advantage of the large information processing capability of the mammalian primate brains. Love seems to be an invention of mammals. I was really appalled at this. And so I, uh, in 1976, there was a symposium on social behavior in reptiles, the first one I think that ever uh, occurred. And uh, I was working on iguanas at that time, which I'll talk to. And I wrote this book, or this article of iguanas and dinosaurs trying to confront this issue. And that sounded initially very scientific and calm and measured. You will see that I probably could not get away with publishing the stuff that I'm going to read you later that I put in that article in a peer-reviewed uh, journal. So why was I upset? Well, because I spent hours uh, with Stanley Rand uh, and others on a little island in uh, Panama watching an area that hundreds of iguanas had come to lay their eggs. But nobody had, Stan had studied the female interactions and their behavior, but nobody actually had been there when the animals started to hatch. So we set up uh, blinds and a situation to watch and wait. We knew about the time in the early May that they would come out. So we were there for a long time. And finally they came out, and what we came, found is that they would emerge from different holes simultaneously. They'd poke their head up, look around, look back down. Other ones would come up, look around. And uh, all of a sudden, from different holes, they would move in mass. They'd come pouring out of, the, out, of, out of the holes. And they would move to like the end of the island. They couldn't stay on that island. It's very small. 
no larger than this room. So they had to go off to the mainland, the Barrel Carver Island, and, and, and uh, Lake Atun in Panama. And uh, they, again, they would sit there waiting, and all of a sudden, they would en masse go across. Because there were birds and crocodiles waiting to pick off the young as they went through. We also showed for the first time that they could actually, if they were, got scared, run, run across the water under, on water. Basque lizards uh, can do this, but it's the first time it was shown that uh, a baby iguanas had to move fast, they could actually run across water. And they would stay together for long times. This actually became a, a cover story in, uh, in Science Magazine. Okay. So I'm saying, I've been a failure. Let's take a look at croc uh, alligators here now, uh, 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 and crocodilians and parental care. When the animals get ready to hatch, they make a sound, and uh, the mothers then come over and will carry them to the uh, to the water's edge. If the eggs haven't hatched, they actually carry the egg very gently down into the water and just gently nudge it until the baby comes out, you'll see. Releases it from the egg. Here's mom with the family. They stay together for years. They can stay with their mom for two or three, or their parents for two or three years. And the fathers also seem to be, uh, uh, be involved. Some of the ideas about alligators or crocodilians eating their babies uh, is because people misinterpreted them picking them up and taking them into the water. Uh, but then, what about the feeding? Here, that... Uh, McElhenney observed, and that was uh, that Neil approached. Here you see a mother holding meat and allowing the babies to come. Call about impulse control. These animals that just you know, see something, want to eat it? No. In fact, how many? How many dogs would hold that food in their mouth for less 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 the puppies? Hmm? So crocodiles in general have a complex territorial system, vocal and visual communication, they guard the nests, they release young, guide them to the water, stay with them every months, if not years, they lead them to new water holes during dry seasons, parent offspring vocal communication, uh, there's some evidence that alarm calls recruit parents to deter uh, predators, including adult con specifics. Adult came in crocodilus in the Pantanal on land are virtually always moving coordinated groups, and they walk head to tail in nearly straight lines. I have there's some wonderful videos of, of a mother alligator and the babies in single file walking across. But hey, that, only dinosaurs and animals can do that, right? Several studies show quite sophisticated cognitive abilities. Some of the early studies on reversal learning and, uh, and so on were done in uh, young crocodiles and alligators. Uh, they're very hard to use as lab animals, which is why probably they have not been used so much. Uh, zoos now are getting into uh, target training as a way to deal with these animals. This is at the Omaha Zoo. Now one thing you have to realize about a reptile being uh, Ectothermic, having a lo lower metabolic rates, about 10% of those of, uh, of mammals, they often operate on a much slower time scale. And so uh, you've got to realize if you sped this up, it may look more mammal like. This may look a little slow. They can train them each with their own different colored. Uh, Wand. And it can be useful 
for uh, health inspections, for giving the animals uh, shots here. You'll see what, uh, you can you know, get the animal to open its mouth and examine its teeth. Good for MRI, maybe? <laughs> There's a recent paper by uh, 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 Vladimir Dinitz and, uh, and others on tool use in, in alligators. What they found is that in, uh, in Florida, where you have some of these egret rookeries, uh, and the alligators like to eat egrets if they uh, get them, uh, what they do is uh, and they do this only during the nesting season. They put sticks over their heads. What the birds do is they fly down to get sticks to build their nests, you know, up in the trees, right? So the alligators have decorate their heads with sticks and then float very slowly under the, uh, under the rookery. And when eagles come down, hey, these are sticks just right there for my nest. They get nailed. Hey, but, you know, that's only a reptile. So I wrote back in this, in this paper in 1976 uh, comments like this. Uh, Carol is stereotyping comments that pose mammals as active, agile creatures, reptiles as sluggish sprawlers should have no place in scientific discourse. Those of us who have witnessed the speed of a basilisk running bipedally on water and who have been bored by a lion lounging on its belly all day know how fatuous such characterizations are. Racism is now taboo. But does easy acceptance of humanism lead to avianism, mammalism, endothermism? Keeping the above in mind, we can better con evaluate arguments for behavioral discontinuity between reptiles and birds and mammals, such as one based on the view that the latter two groups are capable of higher sustained activity levels than ectotherms. Such a view misses the point. Quality and quantity should not be confused. It's the form of behavior that I deem relevant. Decades later, we visited this in a, in a paper uh, with Sean Duty and uh, Vladimir, on, uh, arguing that studies of social behavior really need reptiles because there's so much diversity within the reptilian group between viviparous and oviparous uh, species, between those uh, with parental care and those with not, those that are rapidly developing, those that take a long time to mature. You have such a diversity there that it really uh, opens up lots of opportunities for social behavior research because social organization itself is quite diverse. And we're now working on a, on, on a book uh, trying to bring together all this cool research, recent cool research on, on reptiles. Now, just a couple of examples here of sleepy lizards, which are socially monogamous for up to two months before mating. The same pairs may mate for many years. Separated pairs uh, show that males are more prone to return to females and vice versa. The females often did, which questions a simple mate guarding interpretation. In this species, no male parental care. Uh, but pairing does enhance uh, predator vigilance while feeding with males. Mother offspring recognition, which is probably chemically based. Mothers pay more attention to unfamiliar genetic offspring than to foster offspring, however, so there's that kin selection aspect to it. Offspring pay more attention to unfamiliar real than foster moms. Offspring, but not non relatives, have overlapping home ranges. Pairs avoid mating with relatives and avoid inbreeding. Uh, Related skink species, also in Australia, have all the characteristics of sleepy lizards. They have genetic as well as social monogamy. They live in stable family groups of up to eight individuals, including offspring that take five years or more to mature. And that's been confirmed genetically. In a related species, their large stable social aggregations are found which 83% contain a single adult pair and up to three annual cohorts of offspring. 85% of all juveniles live in social groups, 76% of those with a parent. Right? How many people knew something like that in a lizard? Yet this has been published now for uh, well over a decade uh, by very active groups in Australia. And our green iguanas, uh, some insular chuckawalla species also uh, live in long-term monogamous pairs. Green iguanas live and set up territories in a complex three-dimensional uh, habitat that is very hard to negotiate and defend. Uh, they, are, they learn colors, shapes, they have quite a, 
advance the learning capacities. Hatchling emerge from different nests, as I uh, showed you, and dispersing groups staying together for months. There's hatchling kid kin recognition. They can be trained to be active in captivity. Here's just a quick thing of a, of a zoo. Put to some music, of course. <laughs> Doesn't wag its dog, a tail, but it, uh, how is that different from a dog running over to? There might even be altruism, fraternal altruism. Uh, one of my uh, former students uh, did some work with uh, green iguanas, and uh, what I had noticed is that when he found groups of the green iguanas, we often found them sleeping uh, together with one on top of the other. And we noticed they had eye spots. So the one on the left, uh, you can see the upper animal has its eye open. Uh, uh, but the others have, their, uh, have an eye spot that looks almost as if the eye is open, like if they're looking around. They're aware from a predator uh, perspective. Um, at the time we did the studies, we couldn't sex the babies without, you know, doing uh, violence to them. Um, now we can. And what uh, Jesus did is he found that if you put animals in an enclosure and passed over a predator, and these are all siblings, uh, uh, one animal would jump on top of the other. And it was always the male that jumped on top of his sister. As if, hey, get me, not my sister. And the argument is that Males take a long time to reach sexual maturity and to become the large size, they become dominant, they have a harem kind of system, luck system. Uh, whereas females mature more quickly and reach sexual um, maturity faster, so that from a probabilistic standpoint, it's better to save your sister than yourself, because you may not make it, but your sister has a much better chance. Yes? Is there, is there oxytocin? Hmm? Oh, yeah. I, I don't know too much about the work on it. Uh, I know that people tried to use it at one time because they thought it would be bringing animals into sexual receptivity and things like that. Uh, but I'm not familiar with any recent work. But it could be. could be. Because that's the, that's the thing that people use for mammalian um, children. Markers, right, yeah. It would be good to see if it was there. Um, we studied monitor lizards. You're going to see a number of things about monitor lizards, uh, which are very smart. Uh, uh, this is the black throated one. That's my daughter. Lizard's almost as big as she is. They're the second largest, in a way, compared to the Komodo dragon. Uh, and we did some studies on problem solving in these animals. Uh, we had this little tube, and I had a, uh, we could put mice in them, live mice. If you want to close your eyes, you can. Um, and uh, we had eight babies, and uh, this is the first trial of one of these animals. So, very interested in trying to get to it. There are holes for allow orders to come through. These are very chemically oriented. And it would get it. Now what we found is that all eight animals we tested all solved the problem in the first trial with an average of uh, less than nine minutes. Second trial, they improved. Every one. Furthermore, how they interacted with the tube also changed. For instance, uh, using the paw, the, the, the foreclaw, that improved. They, that, seemed to be a better strategy, and they showed rapid improvement in adapting their behavior. Look at this. Now we move to snakes again. This is snake exploratory tongue flicking behavior. This is a snake that lives in, uh, in, uh, off of Florida. It's unusual for a snake, but that's normal tongue flick. Now look at this tongue flick.
What's going on? There you see that tongue flick? Some little... Again, restraint. The animal's inhibiting itself. It's waiting till the time is just right. Those uh, ex tongue extrusions are much longer than a normal uh, tongue flick. Furthermore, uh, as soon as you put the fish in is when they started doing the behavior. It wasn't something that they were doing all the time. It was context dependent. Then uh, this is done with uh, uh, one of my grad students, Kerry Hansenet, uh, came up with visuals. So these were just, that was a little video of fish moving. No smells though. A snake eye view. And if we had chemical and visual stimuli, they were most important in eliciting the, uh, this tongue luring uh, uh, behavior. But after experience again, some of the animals started to respond just to the visual cues. Again, pretty neat, weird behavior. Another strange story. This is, uh, I like to work with nature scene snakes, and this is an Asian nature scene snake. It's uh, ours in the North America, all live bears in, um, most of the ones in Asia are egg layers and in Europe. And uh, this animal, um, as adults on its birth, if you approach it, has this weird behavior of arching its neck. And in fact, it'll butt that neck uh, towards you. That's very unusual because that's the most vulnerable part of the, of the snake. And it's where most birds and so on, mammals, attack. Why are they doing it? because there are glands in that neck that contain toxins. And when the neck is arched, an irritating liquid is expelled, which contains bufodienolides, toxins that are from toads. This species loves to eat toads. And the individuals that has gets it, sequesters the bufotinolids, dianolids in its nuchal glands by eating. But we also discovered in a paper that uh, Al Savitsky and his students, uh, and Akira Mori, my Japanese colleague, uh, and, and others, a chemist and so on, we worked on this, uh, found that if the mother had eaten toads, she would provision her eggs and the animals would come out full of the glands. If the mother had not eaten a toads, they did not have the bufodienolides in the uh, nuchal glands at birth or at hatching. Now there are also islands that uh, don't have toads. They eat frogs and they'll eat fish in captivity and so on, uh, they have lost some of this nuchal gland defense-related behavior. Rather than, hey, here I am, get me, they flee more, which is a typical snake response, is to flee a possible predator. Uh, but if you take these animals from these islands um, that were on no toads, you feed them, as young on toads, and we did this experiments with other diets too, if they feed on toads, all of a sudden I start acting as if they know that they're now toxic. And they start increasing the nuchal gland display and less prone to flee. So you don't mean they know they're toxic? We don't know. How do they, somehow there's some recognition, could be some physiological change occurring, but nonetheless, their behavior has changed after eating the toads. Okay. And they're from islands that have not had toads for, for many years, as far as we know. This raises then the whole issue of uh, environmental complexity and enrichment 
the welfare issues here too. And uh, so I put, try to put this together along with some of this cognitive work. Uh, and many zoos now are actually starting to enrich reptiles, whereas that never was something that was done in the, in the past. Uh, we did a study uh, where we raised, our, uh, these were year old rat snakes into two environments. Both, of course, very substandard to the natural environment, but uh, one has, uh, we fed them, as most zoos do, with dead prey. They had no substrate to burrow in, uh, no climbing. These are arboreal snakes, nothing to climb on. We gave other animals a more enriched environment. And, uh, and after a number of months, uh, we did a bunch of studies. I'm not going to go through those, but basically uh, the enriched snakes uh, habituated more quickly to strange environments, which is uh, it's a good thing. Uh, they had decreased escape latencies, and uh, they fed more readily on, uh, on both live and dead prey. Rattlesnakes have parental care. We now know that uh, um, they may not be very long lasting, but it's there. And now recently, uh, pythons in Africa, there's a, a person did some wonderful studies uh, showing that uh, mother pythons, it's been known for years that they incubate the eggs and stay with them, but there's also now evidence that the babies stay with, with the mom. And neonate snakes, uh, we did this work on this years ago, uh, will also aggregate together, and this is social aggregation. It's not, again, the, uh, the typical wisdom was that when you ever see snakes together, that's only because there's a common microhabitat. That's, uh, that's attracting them, moisture, heat, and so on, not that they have any social attraction to one another. Turtles. By the way, any questions on any of that stuff? Yeah. Hi, thank you. So far, it's wonderful. Is the inhibition always context-dependent? When you saw the snake, feeding the young. Uh, can you notice if this uh, behavior of inhibition is always linked to some context, whatever, that m has meaning for the animal? You mean by the, with the crocodile? The crocodile, snakes, or whatever, in any reptile, do you, do you think there is a link between uh, exhibiting this inhibition behavior and there is a special context which means the, this inhibition is, is useful in that particular moment. Well, I, I'm sure it's uh, related to the latter, that it uh, has to do with the context in which it, which it occurs. But the fact that it can occur is, I think, itself very significant. Uh, oh, sorry. Can you speak louder? Uh, concerning the social behavior of reptiles, like do, do you see like social hierarchies when they're they're grouped together, like the? Yes, uh, for years they uh, the basic uh, idea of so social organization reptiles has been you either have uh, a territorial system where the animals set up territories and uh, and then females may move between those territories or choose the male based on the quality of the territory or whatever, uh, or you have a social hierarchical system. Uh, where you have dominance and so on. And uh, this, you can have both. And in fact, uh, Bayer Bratstrom, who was one of the pioneers in studying uh, reptile uh, be behavior, uh, uh, showed that uh, in a, if you keep animals in captivity, some lizards, in a large enough enclosure, they develop territories. If you constrain them, increase the density, uh, then they will switch to a hierarchical dominance relationship. System. So there's that plasticity within the species, some of these species, to adapt to the environments. Uh, yes? How, how toxic is the toxin we were talking about earlier for the snake? How toxic? Yeah. Well, um, this is an unusual snake, these rhabdophis, uh, in that they have their rear fangs, so they're venomous, so they have venom. They can bite you that way, and they've been known to kill people. Uh, and they also have this poison in the, in the glands. And uh, it has been known to be very irritating to eyes and so on. Um, I don't know whether anybody, any, the, it's hard to do experiments uh, on it. But I remember when the first time we were trying to extract uh, the, the venom from the, uh, 
from, from the glands, I was told, always wear glasses because you just touch it and it's, and it's, it scatters over your glass. So uh, it's, it's really primed to, uh, to do this and it, has, and it probably has a more irritating effect than uh, unless you eat. Uh, by the way, one thing that, uh, these are toads, uh, recently, my, uh, I've been working with uh, a number of colleagues, as I mentioned, now we brought in Chinese uh, people. In China, there are some interesting related species of uh, Rhabdophis, and there's one now which eats fireflies, firefly larvae. And it also has the nuchal glands and has the display behavior, and fireflies have bufodienolides in them. And so now we're trying to uh, uh, carry out studies in China uh, to document that somehow this animal, the snake, has been able to switch to a rather completely different insect, uh, a prey, and sequester the venom from, uh, or the poison from, from those. No, the problem is that we don't have those kinds of neurological studies with, uh, with, with reptiles and certainly not with crocodiles. But that's why I think they are prime animals to use. One thing about a reptile, unlike uh, uh, dogs and wolves, you want to put them in an MRI, uh, they don't want to stay still. Reptiles often are much more phlegmatic and may stay calm. So I think in some ways specs uh, imaging reptiles uh, might have some benefits. You can get them to stay quiet for. But you won't find a limbic system in there. Sure, you will. What, what, what is the structure actually? Um, the, the, they have all the basic components, including a cortex that you'll find in, uh, uh, in, 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 in mammals and birds, they just call them different things. And so now there's a reassessment, just like there was with bird brains anatomy, there's a reassessment of, uh, of, of how you label uh, the brain regions in, in reptiles. And we published one of the first, uh, probably as far as I know, the first MRI of a, of a snake brain um, years ago. And we've put the various you know, analogs to the, the various brain systems amygdala and stuff like that. You know. Nucleus sphericus, they call things. Give them different names. Um, I had a student who was very interested in uh, social behavior in turtles, and um, uh, pond turtles, like we have around here, painted turtles and um, amided turtles. And most of what was reported in the literature on their social behavior was based on the fact that they like to bask on logs and you can mark them and watch how, they're in, how they interact on basking logs. But what do they do underwater? Well, the Chattanooga Aquarium, uh, it's, uh, south of Knoxville, uh, has a wonderful uh, displays of multi-species uh, pond turtles and you can see them, right? It's glass fronted, as you can see all their interactions. And uh, uh, they do lots of interesting things. Uh, this is a little bit of the courtship display. Some of these animals court a male above the other. Male is almost always smaller than the female. Um, um, they have face offs. And my student is very interested in wolf behavior too. And she noted tail positions and tail movements that nobody had. That because of her familiarity with wolves, she was saying, hey, they're using their tails in similar ways. Uh, coalition formation. Uh, these animals will gang up on a stranger introduced. Uh, things like that are going on in these animals. Uh, but she really focused a lot on, on learning uh, behavior and uh, training them on discriminations. And uh, this is, uh, you can see on the animal on the right, there's a little pebble, or looks like a pebble, it's a 
turtle brittle, this little piece of food, and we train the animals to come up out of the water, choose between two bowls, and, uh, and uh, get the one that had the... Uh, They always eat in the water, so they always had to take the food back into the water to swallow it. Um, just recently, we published a paper, a chapter, on a book on uh, animal personalities, on uh, personality individuality and reptile behavior. They have a lot of personalities. There are differences among them. So in those... Uh, Turtles talk about related animals. These are from the same clutches. You had two styles. You had the impulsive animal that went rapidly up and more often had, did not have a great high probability of being successful, right? You just knocked them over. Uh, the other animals would come up, they'd look back and forth and make a more deliberate decision, right? So you have different styles of decision making uh, within these uh, animals. By the way, we had some of these animals, we had this on this, tra uh, trained on these tasks, we tested them after three years of no experience, they, uh, they knew it, they remembered it. So long term memory, just like an elephant. But what about social learning? Social learning has been demonstrated now in mammals, birds, and even fish, but until a few years ago, uh, not in academic uh, reptiles. Probably the first published paper was by Anna Wilkinson in, uh, in uh, Turtles. Uh, but Karen uh, did it in her dissertation, probably even earlier, based on some observations in this aquarium where it seemed as if turtles were paying attention to what other turtles were doing and maybe learning from it. So we set up a situation using that task where they had to knock over the uh, bottle to get the food, and you had a demonstrator. You had a naive turtles, and you had a demonstrator who was trained to do either the, uh, get the white or the black. Uh, and uh, basically, just show you the results. Uh, if they were trained on the, uh, uh, I had a, a black demonstrator, they chose the black. If they're trained by a white, uh, demonstrator, uh, they uh, went to the white. Okay. Now, what about positive emotions? I'm going to sort of end with uh, the topic I've been focused on uh, now for quite a few years play behavior in animals. And uh, Michelle Kabanek, uh, who's here in Canada, has done a lot of work on. Uh, various aspects of emotion in comparing amphibians, reptiles, uh, mammals. He's published on a variety of animals. And he uh, published a number of papers, but this one here where he argues that emotions actually, and consciousness, actually uh, evolved with reptiles. Before that, amphibians and fish didn't have it. I have disagreements with him uh, on this. Uh, but uh, he does now acknowledge that uh, Play behavior can occur in, in, in reptiles. Whether that is now necessary for consciousness, we'll let you guys argue about that. So I spent a lot of time trying to come up with a definition of play that would allow you to recognize animals as playing, even if you didn't know that they already were playing. Most of the definitions of play uh, assume that you, what you were looking at was play, so it, they weren't very definitive. And I had to come up with some ways of defining or uh, play, or recognizing play in animals that you didn't think play, or in context that you didn't think were playful. Um, and this is just a summary, and uh, I've gone, I have five criteria that uh, have to be, be met. But play is repeatedly, repeated relatively non-serious behavior differing from more adaptive uh, versions structurally, contextually, or developmentally, and voluntarily initiated when the animal's in a relaxed or low stress setting. So the first example that we had was at the National Zoo, where uh, the animal was sort of in a pretty uh, uh, deprived environment. Uh, this a large, older than I was, turtle, now soft-shelled turtle, uh, and um, was self-mutilating itself. It was biting its whole thing. 
And the keeper, who was trained by Chuck Carpenter, one of the pioneers that I started off with, uh, thought, maybe the animal is bored. Nobody had ever thought that a reptile could be bored before. So we started giving it different toys. And this is sort of a basketball. And again, remember these animals operate a little bit slower. Okay. He gave hoops, he gave hoses, he gave a variety of different objects for the animal to, to engage with. And by doing this, uh, the self-injurious behavior basically vanished. That was one of our first cues that environmental enrichment may be an important welfare measure in, in, in reptiles. Crocodiles. I mentioned crocodiles. Uh, these are Toledo Zoo where they provide the balls to the animals. Uh, but here's uh, a uh, Maximo, saltwater crocodile. They use sort of like a tether ball thing, like games with it. And one of the things with an animal like this, you say, oh, it's just trying to eat it, or it's mad at it, or something like that. If you saw that with a dog or an otter, you wouldn't say that. Okay. Um, and what about this? This is talk about otters and uh, sliding down or crows sliding down snow sheets. Okay, and they're waiting their turns. Okay. <laughs> uh, Komodo dragons, my favorite uh, animals. Again, uh, that's the National Zoo, where a lot of this uh, pioneering work was, was done. Uh, they had, this is the first uh, Komodo dragon born in the Western Hemisphere, a kraken. And uh, this is sort of an early video I'm going to skip. It had really good, these developed really good relationships with their keepers. Mom. Okay. Okay. This is a, a I think it's a Sprite can. It knows it's, it's not food. And it plays sort of tug of war with the keeper. And he tosses it, it goes fetch. So that was one of our first indications that there is something really uh, interesting going on with these animals. The keepers also noted, for instance, that the animals would come up and they, they're tall, they will stand up, lean against you, and they started taking things out of your pocket, like notebooks, and then running around with them. Uh, I have a lot, bunch of little videos on that, but I, uh, we now have some in the Knoxville Zoo, and uh, this is Khaleesi. Uh, they have very long tongues. These are very chemically oriented animals, just like, like, like snakes. Uh, but these are some of the things that, uh, I don't know why this is telling me, these are new videos. That's my shoe. We gave it all different kinds of objects. Yeah, this is good with the shoe. So I like to maneuver it like that. Slippers, just like a dog with slippers. Uh, here's a, with a ball, we have different kind of objects. The animal comes around now and pushes the ball around using its, uh, again, they operate a little slower pace. You have to sort of appreciate that. Push the boys, and elephants do that, right? With their trunk. And uh, this is something that 
You might find that orangutans like to put things on their heads, but so do. This neat. It it'll put a pail on its head too and walk around with a pail on it. I can't show all these videos, but the... Okay, I gotta move on. I love, I could spend the whole time showing these videos. So, so to end a little bit, so the reptiles have fun. You decide. But there's a larger question here is uh, a number of us have been arguing that play, social play, and now maybe interspecific play are good ways of trying to get at social cognition. And I'm going to show you now three videos, not done by professionals, but you can got off the YouTube. People who keep pets, now people keep all kinds of pets, right? And so they record some interesting things. Here we have a cat and a turtle playing tag. <laughs> so you have turn taking now. <laughs> now if the turtle wanted to go away, if it was just an, if this was a versin, it wouldn't stay around doing, uh, uh, doing this. It goes on and on, right? It's repeated. That's okay. Okay, let's move on. Uh, this one, there's a lot of talk often about intentionality and things like this, and fairness and inequity aversion shown in dogs as well as the walls, uh, Capuchins. Uh, so here we have the stalker playing tortoise. and a dog. So dogs come in now at the end of this talk. That the turtle's undeterred. See, a turtle moved that fast, right? The end of this is the key, the end of this. Now, that turtle is really upset. Watch what it does now. It knew what it was doing. And it ended up with the ball. Okay. The intentionality. Now, here's the kind of warn. This is between uh, a bearded dragon and a corgi. And now what's interesting is the, is the lovely woman who put this together in her comments on the film said, uh, says, of course, the, it's played to the dog, but not to the lizard. It just wants to eat it. Yet if you saw that between two puppies, and we've studied puppy play, you see the same exact behavior of uh, exchanging and things. Of course, it's mismatched, so you see already self-handicapping. The dog isn't doing as... Uh... So again, this is a social interaction that I think is really intriguing. So play may include the far more important psychological phenomena and evolution than most students of animal behavior have imagined for both the cold-blooded as well as the hot-blooded. The roots of emotion look, run deep once you look clearly. Behavioral similarity, evidence of feelings, neural homology required, you decide. Now my 1976 talk ended by calling for a revolution that has still not come. As I said, I have failed. 
So this is how I ended this paper. One of the things. Studies of reptile behavior and sadly neglected as compared to birds and mammals. Attempts to uplift our attitudes to dinosaurs are admirable, but to do so at the expense of extant reptile behavior is not only to cut off an important source of evidential support for social complexity in dinosaurs, but also to obligingly demonstrate selective scholarship, the exaltation of ignorance, perhaps even bigotry. At best, we have been too hasty and uncritical in accepting the common wisdom. Although I can understand the shaping and discriminatory attitudes through generations of unconscious cultural and even genetic bias, sympathy and patronizing patience do not seem appropriate in the presence of well-publicized propaganda. Thus, we need to be on guard against, quote, science being uncritically accepted as supporting and encouraging our deeply held prejudices. This paper is but a partial brief in behalf of a maligned and oppressed class, class reptilia. Two more slides. <laughs> that was my favorite thing that I probably ever wrote. <laughs> and to get it published. So, an important consequence of doc documenting cognitive and emotional processes in endothermic reptiles, ectothermic reptiles, vertebrates, is that we need to seriously reevaluate the ways in which we maintain and study them in captivity. And uh, this is a book that came out uh, uh, about 20 years ago, Health and Welfare Captive uh, uh, Reptiles, and I'm involved in, as an editor in the new edition of this that we're working on right now. And uh, one of the things that I've been working with, uh, Font, um, Michael, uh, Emmanuel Leo uh, is updating uh, brain measures, comparing uh, avian and non-avian reptiles, going back to the idea that reptiles have such smaller brains as compared to equivalent-sized uh, uh, birds, the tenfold difference. Well, it turns out that there's a problem. Uh, one thing is, of course, Birds are evolved to be very lightweight with feathers and light bones so they can fly, right? A turtle got a heavy shell. Crocodilians, these animals have denser volumes. And so uh, if you start doing some updated uh, measures, uh, the ones on the left with higher, the f first studies were done on 20 reptiles. Uh, Enrique Font has now increased that number to 175. Um, but if you start looking at volume instead of weight, uh, that's the second uh, of value. You see that the differences start to uh, compress. So the, the brain difference is still, still still major, given the same body size, but the difference is now maybe a six-fold rather than tenfold. Yeah. Okay, this is it. There are now unknown as mysteries in the lives of these enigmatic, uh, wonderful animals, and I want you to sort of uh, hopefully convince you to appreciate uh, this group and uh, maybe even get involved with studying and playing with them. Thank you. Well, it was a wonderful talk. and. Uh, just to say a few words, because I'm officially a discussant now. I teach herpetology in the fall at, at McGill. I've taught it for, for many years. And there are, as any professor will let on, there are subtexts that you want to impart to your students. I tell them about amphibians. I tell them about reptiles. But the subtext of that, as I start off the course, is that, to begin with, they don't know anything about these animals. They don't understand them whatsoever. And at the end of the course, I hope they understand them a little bit. And I think at the beginning of this lecture, I would dare say the same thing about the audience here today, that you have a passing acquaintance with reptiles, but no, you don't really understand them. You understand them a bit better now. The one question that I ask my students to, to begin with in class, you know, Imagine a, a lizard, a diurnal lizard, where, you know, is active during the day, wakes up in the morning. What's the first thing that a lizard seeks to start its day? Not to be too anthropomorphic about it, but what's a, what does a lizard need to begin with to start the day? 
cup of coffee, right? Students invariably say, well, it needs to go eat something. It needs food. And I tell them, no, you're thinking like mammals. We need food when we wake up. A lizard or a snake or a frog needs heat. They need to warm up before they can get the food, to eat the food, to digest the food. Until you understand even that small physiological difference, you don't understand the animals at all. You don't. You need to. And so it makes it difficult because they are so much, in many ways, so much like us. They have eyes, ears, noses, you know, legs. But in profound ways, they're not us. And it takes a while to get that, to really understand that. I've been studying amphibians now for 40 years. I don't say I understand amphibians completely. I know a lot about them. But to think like an amphibian, it's a, it's a stretch. You have to try, though. Think like a reptile. I tell my students, whatever animal they're working on, well, imagine, you know, think like that animal. And then you'll come up with some better hypotheses and questions to ask. So with that in mind, I think we got a bit of time, maybe, do we? Yeah. To entertain a couple more questions, one or two. And I'll start at the very back. Okay, is it better? Okay, so like we saw, um, we heard in the other conference about the dogs. Hello? Okay, okay, so like we uh, heard in the other conference about uh, the dogs, um, uh, when they, when they, we be learning about their facial expressions. Uh, so you, we, you talked about the turtles learning from other turtles. So uh, for the reptiles, is it, um, you know, because the dog, they have like the ears and we can see the facial expression, but in reptiles, there's a lack of these anatom anatom anatomical traits. So um, do you think there's a difference uh, from how they learn? And like the bees, they communicate the, the, the place of the, um, of the food with the position of the sun. So they, they communicate like this between them. Do, do you think it's the same for the reptiles? Well, uh, reptiles have different ways of communicating. <laughs> okay. Okay. Reptiles do have a, a variety of different ways of communicating. Chemical cues, of course, are very important. Uh, visual cues, there's uh, lots of studies that Chuck Carpenter and so on uh, perfected the study of lizard displays. A lot of the lizards have these head pop displays, which uh, really can, uh, can be seen at a distance. They can communicate many aspects of information, sex, dominance, uh, uh, a variety of different uh, uh, features. Uh, hearing is not, not that developed in, uh, in reptiles, except crocodilians have a good set of vocalizations, a number of lizards do, but even lizards that don't have sounds, produce sounds, know and can hear sounds. So there are studies now on eavesdropping in lizards. Lizards can eavesdrop on the alarm calls of birds, for instance, and uh, respond uh, uh, appropriately and become much more alert if they hear certain alarm calls of a bird versus a non-alarm call of a, of a bird. So there's levels of complexity that, uh, again, the fact we don't we can't say, oh, yeah, there's something like, you know, in the environment. The animal's alertness is shown just by a change of his head, by a very subtle cue. Uh, one of my students one time says, uh, lizards aren't boring, they're subtle. And I think that's one of the things that uh, uh, we have to appreciate, that the type of cues that they respond to and how they respond is, again, rather different and alien to us, but that it's not beyond our capability of understanding. I'll Please go with the two. quick, complicated.